Life and Biswas, they're all the way from Nepal. Uh, they've been uh, doing the work of the Apostolic Day in Nepal, and it's a long way off from home, so we're so glad to have them here this morning. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, during the break, you have an opportunity to meet with them and to, and to greet them, so thank you as you do that. Uh, I want to talk a bit more about oneness and Zion, and I know that we have done that in the ALSs and in the Apostolic School of Ministry, but today is going to be some repetition, and I realize that repetition is very important. I've always stated that repetition is the mother of learning, and uh, some of these spiritual truths have to be uh, taught over and over again and we teach until it manifests so as a pastor don't hesitate to teach the same thing over and over in your church uh, because we teach until it manifests we do not teach to impress we teach to manifest so our keynote scripture was Psalms 133 behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity it is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now, when God said to the nation, or rather in Exodus 4.22, let me read that to you, it says, You shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, let my son go that he may serve me. Notice it is not sons, it is let my son, God regarded the whole uh, community of Israel as one son. And so God has not departed from that, and that is the operating system of God when he looks at a city it does not look at the phenomenon of local churches as we look at them. We're looking from an earthly perspective, but from an heavenly perspective, uh, the reckoning is not as local church. In the 1970s and 1980s, there was a great move through people like Dick Iverson, who passed away this month, and we honor him for the teaching on local church and loyalty to local church but that was a revelation of that season and now there is a major shift from local church to city church. So God in this season, the Daba, the Rema, is the city church, the body of Christ in the city. That does not mean you have to, you have to abandon local church. The local church is a household of faith. As I often mention, the local church is the house of the human father the house of the pastor. So whenever you say you want to go to a particular church, you would say, well, we're going to Tamil's church or Sergi's church. A lot of folk won't actually know the name of the church, but they will call the church by the name of the father of the house. And that's true. It is the house of a father. In a local church, a, a pastor can lock out God, so therefore it's his house. He can keep God out of that house. So... So uh, a lot of folk have done that already, and they don't know it. But the major shift now, the major migration, is to the city church, and we only understand the tip of the iceberg. And I know over the next couple of years, there will be greater revelation pertaining to the body of Christ, the city church. But Psalms 133 must be read together with Ephesians chapter 4, when you're talking about community and collaboration and the joint supplying and every part doing its share uh, and our apostolic or other fivefold ministry operates within the ambit of the city church in the context of Ephesians chapter 4 and the context of oneness. Those who are focused on local church and refuse to listen to the voice of God over the last 10 years will be plagued with severe problems in the local church. There will be a resurgence of Jezebel, Absalom, Korah, Adonijah, religious spirits, false brethren, 
Assyrian attacks, Babylonian attacks, SARS attack. <laughs> All those things that will come into your local church. So the word of the Lord in this season is the understanding of city church. And I know over the next couple of years, uh, there's going to be a lot of revelation on that. And the understanding of that, which is still very difficult, we have been laboring with that concept now for 20 years, and I still feel we, we do not know a lot about it, and we do not know particularly how the tribes come together. Even today, there are tribal configurations. Uh, we look at denominations as a single tribe. For instance, in a crowd, you can just know who's an Anglican and who's a Baptist, uh, because of this, this aura of tribal configuration over people that come from those backgrounds. And of course, Pentecostals can be known from a mile away. It's very easy to discern <laughs> that particular tribe. So there's still a lot of under, uh, revelation that has to come on that. And in Psalms 133, when you read it, behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity, you must look at it as a, a brother as a local church. So one local church is a brother, and another local church is a brother, and, uh, and uh, it is good and pleasant when these brothers, these local churches, dwell together in the spirit of oneness. And when we talk about oneness, it's the word Iyad, Deuteronomy 6.4, Yero Israel, the Lord your God is one, and the word here means to listen, understand, and do the oneness of God. So it's very important to do it, not only to know it. Right now we are s stuck in the realm of knowing. And the biggest uh, transition that needs to take place is from revelation to implementation. And so I know that this is becoming more common and it's going to happen. So when you look at brothers dwelling together in unity, it's churches dwelling together in in unity, and the oneness, the oneness is the function of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that brings people together. As much as we may try, it is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in John chapter 17, 22, Jesus said, The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And we know that the glory that he gave, was the Holy Spirit. He breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, and the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Glory. We also see this in Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 3, where it says, Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the people, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. That glory is the Holy Spirit. The glory of the latter house is the Holy Spirit. And it says in that context, Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. The glory of the Holy Spirit confers an attractive mantle to the gathering of the people. So there's an effortless migration of people into such locations. The Bible says the latter days a mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted. That's a reference to Zion, the city church, and all nations shall flow to it without an invitation. I know pastors get offended when you don't send them invitations. But in this move of God, there's coming a time where there will be no invitation. It, you, you just have to know if you have the Spirit of God, as when, uh, when the word of the Lord came to Cyrus. And as, uh, the Bible says in that context that the Spirit stirred the people. So we no longer wait for invitations. Don't get offended if you don't get an invitation. You should know where you should be. Sons of God should know where they, where they should be. Uh, there's another cryptic scripture that says, where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered. That must be looked at both literally and prophetically. The eagles there, the Romans operated under the banner of the eagle, and they were gathered on the carcasses of the Jews. But prophetically we redeem that by saying that where the body of Christ is, there the eagle Christians will be. An eagle, lion, ox, man, all of that points to the overcoming believer. And the consistent symbol of the overcomer is also the eagle. And that's where they will be. And eagles have overcome the phenomenon of the pulling power of local church. 
So a lot of folk are fossilized in local church. They're stuck in local church. And I want to say to you, great tribulation is coming to the local church to, to, to shatter some of your belief systems so that you'll understand that there is only one body in the city and how we need to take uh, accountability and understand that we are our brother's keeper. That means we must also keep other local churches and have a burden for other local churches, even those that may not agree with everything that we say. And that's why later on, we'll talk, if we have time, we'll talk about uh, the, the, the gathering in oneness, how, does it, how is it configured, the understanding of uh, agreement on essentials, and how important it is to know what the essential doctrines are and to focus. That's a starting point, essential doctrines. As pastors in the city must come together, discuss essential doctrines, uh, agree on them. And that's a starting point. That's a starting point. So the Holy Spirit is responsible for bringing the body together. And in Zechariah 4, you see the, goal, the, the candlestick, the single candlestick. Zechariah didn't see many candlesticks. He didn't see ten candlesticks. He just saw one candlestick as a representation of the one body of people. And that one candlestick, in that context, he says, not by power, not by might, by, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Again, you see the anointing, the spirit of God, responsible for that oneness. And um, if you read Psalms 133 carefully, it says there, a very curious statement, that the anointing, or rather the dwelling of the brothers together, is like precious oil on the head. It's like precious oil. That means the oneness of the brotherhood is like the anointing. It's like the anointing oil. It's like oil. And I mention this often, that when you put oil in a jar of water and shake it, the droplets disperse. But if you leave it overnight, the oil droplets just get attracted to each other and form a sludge on top of the water. And basically, the oil droplets have an intermolecular attraction that forces them together. And the Bible says oneness is like that. Every household, every believer has a droplet of oil and that droplet of oil makes you attracted to another believer, another authentic believer. Therefore, the gathering of the body of Christ is not something that has to be manipulated. It's an automatic manifestation of the anointing. So people that do not want to come together, we must therefore assume that they do not have the anointing in them. They have something for it. So this is very important for you to understand. This is an effortless thing that those who are authentic believers look for other authentic believers. So it is not, you don't have to manipulate, you don't have to do anything. Uh, when I got saved many years ago, I was deeply attracted to other Christians. No one had to come and tell me about that. It just happened in my life after I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. I was always looking for other believers. And I realized that that is a, a very important characteristic of truly being filled with the Spirit of God. Now, this gathering of the believers together and dwelling together uh, from different local houses, houses coming together, uh, if you read Psalms 132, it must be read together with Psalms 133. It talks, the entire context is actually Zion. So uh, the Bible gives us about 10 different things about Zion. And 132, the Zion is God's dwelling place. Zion is God's resting place. It's the place of his throne. It's the place of, his, of salvation. There's several things there. The honor of David will, will bud. And you know that the honor of David is a reference to the tabernacle of David. And the tabernacle of David, again, cryptic language for the body of Christ. Cryptic language for, the, the, for Zion. Acts chapter 15, Amos 9, 11, where the apostle James was talking about the events that were taking place on the day of Pentecost and the subsequent coming in of the Gentiles. He was talking in the reference to Zion, the church. So... When we talk about Zion, Zion cannot be 
refer to just local church. It is a city church. It is the throne of God where God rests, the resting place of God. Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have nests. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head to rest. He cannot lay his head to rest on a local church. He is looking for a body. And when that body begins to manifest in a city, the head of Jesus connects. And uh, the Bible says that is his dwelling place. And we know according to 1 John 4.16 that, uh, our, that the, the Bible tells us that God is love and he who dwells in love dwells in God. So where brothers dwell together in love, then God dwells there. Then by inference, we can know that this ag- actually where brothers dwell together in unity, that that is Zion. Zion is not a geographical location. It's not up there north according to uh, uh, dispensationalists. Zion is the people of God. And uh, Zion is the church of Jesus Christ. Zion is the new Jerusalem. Uh, Many, many references cryptic references to what Zion is. Zion is Israel, Zion is Bethlehem, Zion is a Judah company, Zion is, a, is the holy city, Zion is a righteous city, Zion is the city of truth, Zion is Epsiba, Zion is Beulah, Zion shall be sought out. All this refers to the church dwelling in oneness, to the elect that have come together in oneness, that is Zion, and the Bible says, this is the people of God. So Zion is not mortar, bricks, it's not a physical mountain. It is the people of God and uh, it is the city of truth, it's the city of righteousness. It is the new Jerusalem, it is the descending city coming out from God, manifesting on the earth. So the, the, the shift that has to take place is for us to look beyond local church to look at the body of Christ, to, to begin to become a part of the body of Christ physically. We can no longer say the body of Christ is invisible. It has to be seen. It has to be demonstrated. And so I know that uh, uh, these things are going to be very challenging, how that is configured, all of that, but it will begin to manifest in the days and months ahead. So, uh, when you talk about that company of people, that company is highly zealous for God. The Bible says, my people, your people shall be willing in the day of your power. So, the characteristic features of Zion is the people of God are, are zealous, they are enthusiastic, they are people of integrity. The Bible says, who shall ascend to the mount of God? He was clean hands, clean heart, uh, not lifted up to idolatry, and there's no deceit in his mouth. And if you study uh, Revelation 144, or rather Revelation 14, it talks about the company of 144,000, which again is a prophetic number referring to governmental believers, Zion believers, that are people of high integrity, people of righteousness, Practical righteousness, no guile in the mouth. It's a people who are overcomers, a people who uh, are stable, a people who understand and know the principles of rest, a people who become the stronghold of God, a people who have the indwelling and manifest presence of God, a people who have the name of the Lord written on their foreheads. That means the character of God is imprinted in them. And it's a mature company, the Bible says, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. And this company of people live in a culture, and that culture is apostles' doctrine, because you know that Zion is called the city of truth. The Bible says, out of Zion, the law will go forth. So doctrine is very high on the agenda, and I know it's an evolving process. We'll start with the understanding of what the essentials are, an agreement on the essentials. But from there, there is migration into present truth and proceeding word. So there is a culture of God there, doctrine being one of the first pillars. Secondly, 
It's a city of fellowship. The Bible says Zion shall be a compact city. Relationships are very tight. They are not loose relationships. There are highly committed relationships. There's a brotherly love in that relationship. Uh, all of that is seen within the context of the church in Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love manifested in the city, city of joy, fellowship. Uh, the second, third pillar being the table of the Lord. The Bible says there's corn and wine in Zion, uh, referring to the principle of sacrifice and deeply entrenched in Zion. And there are prayers in Zion. Isaiah 65, 24, before you call, I will answer, is all in the context of Zion. So Zion has very strong apostolic culture. Zion has very strong community. Uh, and Zion has very powerful and unique blessings. So I want to talk to you today about some of the blessings. Uh, there are over 30 blessings, but we'll just touch on some of the blessings. These blessings are beyond beyond local church. Uh, when you have a local, local church blessings, they are minuscule compared to the blessings that come into a city because of the city church. Remember, this is now Zion coming out from the mind of God, the heart of God, and uh, manifesting on the earth. That means this must be seen on the earth. Just as a local church has an address, the city church, the body of believers in a city, the first fruit company, those co not everyone can come together, but a first fruit company coming together will present this first fruit offering, will be the first fruits unto the Lord, and when the Lord sees the first fruit, he reckons it as the whole. Yeah. Amen? He reckons it as the whole. So this is not about numbers, it's about a first fruit company, a remnant, that God rises up, raises up in a city, and it's effortless, it is, it's not drudgery, it must not be painful, uh, uh, for, for, for pastors and leaders to gather together. Uh, if you look at some of the city churches in the Bible, uh, the Jerusalem city church, it was fundamentally flawed because it had only one culture, the Jewish culture. It had, uh, there was absence of diversity of leadership, there were only apostles. They focused just on Jerusalem and uh, it emphasized uh, emphasized uh, personalities, therefore Peter was the celebrity and it was driven by manifestations and so God had to shut that down, he dispersed that and when you move to the next city church, city gathering was Antioch and Antioch moved beyond apostles and prophets and teachers and they functioned as a team, there was great interaction, intimacy with the Lord and uh, Within Antioch, there was this, they moved beyond ethnic diversity. There was great Holy Spirit sensitivity uh, in Antioch. And so there are other city, city churches. Uh, uh, when Paul would write to the Cor Corinthians, he would write to the whole body of believers in Corinth. And even in Ephesus, we see the horn of David budding, uh, starting there in the school of Tyrannus. So, City churches have always been there, but uh, never been, you know, emphasized. Martin Lloyd Jones was a physician to the king at a city church. He would uh, teach every week, and and pastors would come from all over, uh, and eventually that grew to I think a couple of thousands. Uh, John Calvin also. Uh, at that, I haven't researched this in detail, but I know if I go back and look in history. The, the, there would have been many, many others who would gather pastors and leaders together in a culture rather than an event. What you see in the U.S. today with all those mega gatherings, and even in parts of Africa, they are merely events. And those are high-budget events. So when we're talking about city church, there's no budget. Everything is, is easy. Because so we have had uh, now about three major gatherings, and uh, our last uh, all those gatherings cost didn't they didn't didn't require a budget, and our last uh, last meeting was the last Tuesday, where we where we bought the threshing floor, 
uh, as David bought the threshing floor uh, to, uh, to, to end the plague, to end the plague. And that became the foundation of Solomon's temple, Solomon's temple being a symbol of uh, the city church. And all these events are low budget events. In fact, uh, when it came to the threshing floor, to just show you the level of anointing, we asked for an offering to buy the threshing floor. We collected over 700,000 rand in just one meeting to buy the threshing floor. People were willing to give. Actually, I had to send a message, please don't bring any more money because we have spent more than David on that little piece of threshing floor. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying, when you come to that place of city church, uh, there's an effortless gathering, there's no budget, uh, everything must become easy. Um, there are a whole lot of blessings connected to the city church, and the blessing is because the Bible says, there the Lord commands the blessing. That means you don't have to pray for anything, you don't pray for blessings. It is the local command center. The blessings are there. So when you come to that location, the blessing is automatic. The Bible says of David, I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. That means God's hand is there. And you know that God does not have a hand. His hand speaks about the fivefold ministry, so his grace is there, his fivefold ministry is there. So when you get under that hand, there's an automatic blessing. There the Lord commands a blessing. Isn't it so great to walk into a place where you can just be blessed? That's what I'm talking about, because the Bible says, Every place I record my name, I will meet with you there to bless you. A lot of the meetings you go to, it's not the Lord's name that is recorded there, it's the pastor's name. So you may not get blessed. In fact, you, certain blessings may get subtracted from your life in certain meetings <laughs> that I know. But there are locations you can go to. The Lord's name is there. And when the Lord's name is there, uh, there's always blessings. And uh, we must be blessing preachers as well. Not only suffering preachers, but blessing preachers. I want pastors to be blessed. I want pastors to live long on the earth. When a pastor dies, it's a great loss because it takes 20 years to, to actually train a pastor for him to come to maturity. And uh, when a pastor dies, it, it is indeed a great loss uh, because it takes so many years to produce someone who is effective. And a pastor is a highly a set man of a church, is a highly... Uh, he evolutionized being. He not only can teach and preach, he, can, he's known, he knows what it is to be a taxi driver, he knows what it is to take people to the hospital, he knows what it is to do funerals, birthday parties, MC, gardening, building houses, a whole host of things are unbelievable. How, how the level of evolution <laughs> that you will see. If I want advice about anything, I go to pastors. Uh, I don't go to other professionals. If I want plumbing done, I phone a pastor. <laughs> Carpentry, I phone a pastor. Mechanic, phone a pastor. Certain pastors that are masters of the gearbox and everything about, about all of that. So, so we, we thank God for pastors. Therefore, we want pastors to live long. And one of the blessings is, there the Lord commands the blessing, life forevermore. Your life gets extended when you belong to the city church, we're involved in the city church. The Bible says the minimum age of Zion is 100 years, not 70 years, it's 100 years. When you're 70, you're just ready to start. So, so you, don't, you don't think of expiring, you think of finishing the work that God has asked you to do, and, uh, and uh, in Zion, you can live 100 years and beyond. So um, the process of degeneration gets stymied when you in Zion. Your youth gets renewed when you in Zion. So a lot of folk don't know this. They don't know how when you belong 
to a city church gathering which is now beyond your network, beyond your denomination, beyond uh, your parish church. Unfortunately, pastors have to know how to migrate beyond denominations, parachurches, networks, and fraternals. All these were scaffoldings for city church. So now the scaffoldings have to go, and we now have to come to the place where we respect other people. You respect the Baptists, you respect the Methodists. You can engage in a great discussion. In fact, my heroes are in the Presbyterian Church. Some of the books I've studied. I've studied books by John Piper and, uh, and several other people. Uh, some, uh, uh, David Shilton wrote one of the best books I know on, on Revelation. And he was a Presbyterian minister. So some of these folk are highly loaded. And we need to see how we can get these different technicians together uh, within the, the ambit of the city church so we can drink of their grace and enjoy their grace. And, uh, and uh, within the context of the city church, uh, we do not get offended when people disagree with us. As Tamu will always talk about, the fact that we are presenting a perspective. So all of that is now tested within city church. It does not mean we become yes men, we, we, we challenge others, we, we, we talk about doctrine, we're not afraid to talk about doctrine. And I found that if you meet a reasonable man or woman of God, they are always humble enough to hear your perspective. So all of this is, is an exciting uh, time for the church of Jesus Christ. I see God bringing up more and more denominational leaders, uh, even when I was in Cape Town with the Assemblies of God, I found the leaders in the Assemblies of God to be very humble men uh, who are ready to engage doctrinally. So we must use that opportunity, that window, to jump in and talk about the body coming together. So, a whole host of benefits. So, one of his health benefits and uh, and the Bible says the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies. Make alive, revive, regenerate, stymie, stop the process of degeneration and a whole host of benefits of health when you are within, uh, when you are in the city church. In fact, our gathering has been gaining so much of momentum that God has spoken to us very strongly about about our diet, what we should eat, what we should not eat. And uh, this was different from, a, from just a medical perspective. Uh, God spoke to us in such a way that at the same time, he gave us grace to restrain ourselves when it came to eating certain foods. And so if you, if you in a few months' time, when you come into Durban, you'll find that pastors would have lost a lot of weight <laughs> Uh, right now, the biggest losers are in our forum. They lost, they lost so much of weight. So, so all of this is because of the great dimension that comes from city church gatherings. The Bible says it is like precious oil flows down from the head down to the garment. And the substance of the oil on the head is the same as the substance of the oil on the M of the garment. Uh, and the oil on the head of the garment, uh, on the head of uh, Aaron, that oil is the spirit without measure. Because only Jesus has a spirit without measure. And that's the Isaiah chapter 11, spirit of the Lord, fear, counsel, might, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, seven spirits of God, the spirit without measure. Now, in the city church, the body of Christ, it covers the whole body. That does not happen in a local church. The level of anointing in a local church is always less than the level of anointing in the city church. I can tell you this, I walk into my local church, the level of the anointing in my local church, where I am pastoring now for more than 20 years, is minuscule compared to the level of anointing when I come into the city church. When I'm sitting in the city church, while I'm sitting there, I receive revelation from the Lord. Even if others are speaking, people ask me, where do you get all these messages from? I, I generally don't tell them, but now you know. When I'm sitting in the city church, 
these thoughts just come to me and I write them and I go and I develop them. So God speaks very loudly because the oil, the substance, the substance of the anointing on the head is same as the substance on the garment. I just don't want to go too much with the time. Okay. So, so that anointing confers all the benefits. It confers health benefits. It confers long life. Uh, it uh, it all all the degeneration process. It confers prosperity, prosperity, biological, psychological, social, and spiritual prosperity. You must understand when God said to the people in Babylonian captivity, "I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future." The plan of God was a people coming together to build the temple. That was the plan. That plan could not be activated while they lived as individuals in Babylon. They had to come together for the unveiling of God's plan for prosperity. The reason why many Christians suffer unnecessarily is because they have no revelation of the city church. The city church does not only have fivefold ministers, it will have plumbers, it will have doctors, it will have lawyers, of all kinds of people. Jerusalem is an example, it had apostles. Brethren and elders. So, it's people from different walks of life. The Bible says the kings of the earth bring the glory into it. So this is exactly what happens where the kings bring their sons, the apostles bring their sons, they bring all kinds of giftings into the city church. So in the city church we must have the best doctors, best lawyers, best plumbers who will be directed now by fivefold eldership how to be of benefit to the whole body of Christ. So this understanding still has to be unveiled. We are our own greatest enemies. We are robbing ourselves of the anointing and the grace of God that would bring prosperity to the people of God. The whole host of benefits besides healing, deliverance, uh, there's a blessing of strength. Strength comes to the body in the city, safety, encouragement, sharpening, your limitations get broken, there's a favor of God, the prayer base of the, of the church in the city is greatly enhanced because we are now no longer praying from events, we are praying from culture. That's, that's vastly different. And so within this, the, the city church you get restoration, uh, when the Bible talks about restoration in the book of Joel, it is all in the context of the body and not as a context of an individual local church. Acceleration, everything going faster and faster, is also within the context of the city church. For instance, Aaron's rod budded, flowered, bore fruit overnight, and that epitomizes acceleration, which is a plowman, overtaking the reaper. But that acceleration only took place when the rod was placed in the Ark of the Covenant, next to the Ark of the Covenant, and the rod was placed in the most holy place, and the most holy place's dimensions are length is equal to the breadth is equal to the height. It was four square, most holy place was four square, and it prophetically pointed to the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation where the length is equal to the breadth is equal to the height, and it points then to the city church, which is a manifestation of Zion, length equal to the breadth equal to the height, where is a final equalization of all things. And so that's when the acceleration begins to take place. And everything is going to move faster and faster and faster. The city church will confer immunity. Immunity not only from disease, immunity from demonic attacks, uh, immunity from terrorism, immunity from several of the problems we are facing today. Psalms 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, is actually about immunity, and the secret place of the Most High is Christ, and the secret place of the Most High is the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is Zion, and that's Psalms 91, 
It says, there a thousand fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. It will not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. And then you'll be covered under his wings, etc. All of that needs to be, needs to be brought to the place of implementation and practice. And that happens within the context of the city church. The issue of dominion, the church coming to its dominion and rulership happens when you find the city church rising up, the horn of David begin to budding and flourishing in the city. And I will not go further on that besides to mention the Ark of the Covenant comes out from the most holy place. And that's a figure of the church of the end times. That's, that is a city church rising up from the most holy place, a first fruit company rising up with power and authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, a church that will rule in the midst of its enemies. We're not talking about a weak church. We're not talking about a church that is afraid to engage politically. We're not talking about those elements. This is a, a, a church that is rising up with great authority and power and that has the power to decree things. The Bible says you shall decree a thing and it shall come to pass. That level of church has moved beyond uh, information and inspiration to installation. That church is capable of installing and uninstalling. Okay? So this, this is a very, very powerful church. It has moved beyond prophetic Prophetic is merely to say what's in the elementary definition of prophetic is to say what's going to happen in the future. This kind of church installs things in your future. Amen? By the power of decrees. Elijah had the capacity to install and uninstall. He says there will be no rain at my word. So basically he was, he was, uh, he was uninstalling rain. Amen? Think of this as a software ex expert that comes into the city and makes some decrees okay, that can install and un uninstall. This was old, old Testament. You look at Eli installing a baby in Anna's womb at the declaration of his word. So I want you to know there's something more powerful than just prophesying its installation. And if Peter's shadow could do it so silently and confer healing, can you imagine what a big shadow a church in the city will confer upon the city? Independence has wrecked us. Independence has destroyed us. And... Uh, when we embarked on this uh, many years ago, 20 years ago, we decided to serve pastors rather than preach to pastors. Long before the ABC Forum existed, I was serving pastors. I, I would go and serve in other forums. Uh, I never expected that one day God would, would take me and, and allow me to speak to pastors because I was quite content serving I was happy in fact everyone knows this in our church when I used to go to the church Pastor Sydney's church my prayer every Sunday was please father don't ask the pastor to call me to pray <laughs> because I am not I am not I don't enjoy public discourse I would say as far as leadership is concerned I am probably number 50, 56 57 because God had chosen many other people along the way but because they were not able to, to live by proceeding word, uh, God moved them out. So city church is high on the agenda of God, the body of Christ. And listen, there's no celebrities now. That, that season is over. Uh, I didn't, a lot of people come to me and say, Dr. Segi, well done, you raised so much of money. I say to them, listen, in the Old Testament, David bought the threshing floor, but today... A company of Davids have bought the threshing floor. We have moved from singular to plural. 
So there are some sons that can do a better job preaching than I can do. A few years it was not like that. And I'm not jealous of them. I'm so excited that that is happening now that God is raising up young people in their 20s that are able preachers, able to dissect the word and able to speak a now word, able to hear from God and to do that. A few years ago it was not like that. It's beginning to happen and it's going to continue to happen at an accelerated pace. Now, the ministry is going to be very attractive, but it's not going to be attractive to the ambitious. Uh, it's going to be attractive to, to, the elect, to the elect. The elect are going to come in at an accelerated pace, and uh, you're going to see more young people being qualified with secular degrees also entering the ministry. And so we're looking forward to that. We, we are excited about that, that the matriculants will no, lo- no longer just be ambitious to become doctors and lawyers and accountants, but they'd want to be at the cutting edge of what God is doing right now. So, uh, there are a whole host of benefits, restoration, acceleration, immunity, dominion, answered prayer. Your prayer gets answered much quicker within the context of a city church. Every unemployed person that came into the city church in the last 15 years, everyone, not 99%, everyone got a job. Because you're in that environment. And uh, and what happens, the devil doesn't want you to come into that environment. So the devil removes all restrictive influence. So you quickly get a job, so then you can't come to the forum anymore. (laughs) So every, everyone, so look look at how this thing is working now. It's working for everyone, okay? So, so, the, the other benefits is sight. When you come into the, to the city church, you receive an aunt's sight. The Bible says on this mountain, the veil that is cast over the people will be removed. So you'll be able to see quicker. You'll no longer persecute David when David rises up. You will not be a Saul. You'll no longer mourn, mourn for Saul. You'll no longer strike the rock twice. You'll no longer go looking for the garment of Elijah because you can see clearly you have washed yourself in the pool of Siloam. So uh, those are just uh, some of the benefits. I've just got 13 more minutes. One very important benefit of, uh, of this location is that you receive an anointing for mortification. There's an anointing for mortification. Mortification, self-denial, to die to yourself. We are experiencing now an untempered flow of the flesh, even in the church. If you look at the global church, look at mega churches, as more and more pastors are being caught out for sexual misdemeanors. Uh, Mega church pastors, those who started those churches, uh, are are now being exposed for being sexual deviants. And uh, and, uh, the reason for that is because when you are independent, when you are alone, you miss out on the commanded blessing. There's only present there in Zion. And one of those blessings is the anointing of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. The the anointing of might to overcome the flesh. Now, one of the biggest problems you have in among believers is fleshly indulgence. You have factional sins, emotional sins, lustful sins, sexual sins, witchcraft, secret sins. One of the biggest secret sins is pornography. Pornography is huge. It's a secret sin. And it's a vicious cycle. What pornography does is plenty of evidence, medically speaking, that pornography shrinks your brain. You can do an MRI scan before and after, 
and you actually see the gray matter shrinking. Okay? Now, this is very serious because if you, if you have sugar, it shrinks your brain. If you have too much of carbohydrates, it shrinks your brain. If you have uh, alcohol, it shrinks your brain. If you are stressed, it shrinks your brain. As you get older, your brain shrinks. And now you've got pornography, it shrinks your brain. Some people got nothing left. <laughs> So you have to be in an environment where that process is reverse. Now, I, I once was in a conference and someone asked me a lot of questions. And the answer to every question was city church, or the body of Christ. So people asked me, what's the solution to pornography? And guess what the answer is? City church. So how is that possible? Well... There's an anointing there. In Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about his own struggle. He says, that thing I hate to do, that I'm doing. Deep in your heart, you hate to eat chocolate cake, but you still eat it. <laughs> the thing you hate to do, that you do. Okay? So how do you overcome that? And he says, but I thank God through Jesus Christ. And then he, he goes on to Romans chapter 8. You know, you, you must take out that, remove the chapters and read it as one. And then he says, he starts like, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. He says, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Let me paraphrase it to you, for you. The law of the anointing. The law of the anointing of life in Christ Jesus. Now where's the life? Psalms 133, where brothers dwell together in unity. There the Lord commands the blessing. Life. So life is there. And the law of the anointing is there. It says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free. From the law of sin and death, which is the work of the flesh. So when you gather together, that's why the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling together of the saints as you see the day approaching. Because there's this, this, this anointing there to deliver you from the works of the flesh that no drug can do that. We are, we are entering the realm now of drug failure. You must understand there are certain drugs now no one can deliver you from. We're having a problem with drug addiction. It's hopeless. No, no rehabilitation. Nothing can help you. You need to be in an environment. And listen, in that environment, the deliverance is automatic. The brothers love together. They share together. They serve God together. There's no competition. There's no strife. There's no fighting now about who's going to take the offering. There's no fighting now about who's going to preach. So, there is now an untempered flow of anointing, precious oil. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the law of sin and death. And Within that anointing, how does that work? The Bible says when you've got that body there, the head of Jesus lands on that body. Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have, uh, have nests, son of man has nowhere to lay his head to rest. But when that body is presented, the head of Jesus lands and you can say, we have the mind of Christ. Yes. So the mind of Christ is no longer enslaved to wicked imaginations. You now can cast down imaginations at every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God because you are in that environment where the anointing of your brother, the grace of your brother within that gathering comes upon you and you just get automatically lifted up. We have seen this thing work so many times. We get lifted up. You, if you have a chance one, uh, in the future to talk to some of the people that have been through some difficult times, even in our city, 
they will tell you how just the gathering <coughs> helped them deliver them from all kinds of problems there you don't have to struggle with addiction the addiction leaves you it disappears you have the mind of christ the head of jesus has landed the anointing flows and you are delivered from all kinds of misdemeanors because of a restraint there's a restraint there's a fear of the lord there's a there's a, the anointing of might anointing of wisdom knowledge understanding that comes upon you that within the within a city church if we say something we find that it has great power it had greater power when i declare something in a city church than when i declare it in the local church when i when i told pastors i said to pastors listen you try to stop eating bread rice and milk because you must have the fitness of a racing driver for the ministry and that's not good fuel for you because there's highly processed food and it was not what god made man has interfered with it they add so many dyes to rice there's so much of chemicals added and to bread it's no longer the bread that jesus ate and it's contributing to diabetes and hypertension when i said it in the local church it was not so powerful when i said it in the city church people just grabbed it and they now leading healthy lives uh, they are now more focused the mind is more clear and uh, and you know that our food is highly poisonous and uh, you may have the, the the understanding of that but the understanding of that has to be empowered by grace yes. and the anointing and grace comes when everyone comes together listen there are giftings within our city that are so powerful but they are disconnected from the city church in the city church everyone will eventually find his place and it's a place where life is given strength comes to you and you're able to lead a life of mortification and a life of mortification is a life of self denial you are able to come under the instruction of another Amen. come under the instruction of another how do i know that you are mortified when you come under the instruction of another when you are able to submit to the instruction of another when you are able to suffer for another when you are able to bless another that's why in the in the book of acts you see the first church on the day of pentecost they were able to suffer for another debts were cancelled and so within the city church people buy cars for other pastors that do not have cars people will settle the bond for another pastor or another believer that is having financial difficulties so there's no lack as a body comes together because we now have the burden god fills you with the burden for your brother and you become your brother's keeper this is effortless this is no longer put on this is no longer fake the grace comes and and you feel yourself having a deep love for other churches and for other believers and this is what community is all about this is what the compact city is all about you are able to come under another inst- instruction of another you are able to suffer for another you are able to bless another you are able to walk in love for another the bible says that the love of god be shed abroad in your hearts the bible talks about the love of god being poured into your hearts that means even the love agape love is not your love it is a love that god has that he put inside of you and that love comes when the body comes together then your faith levels move to another dimension that's why paul would say i am crucified with christ he talks from the principle of mortification before he even engages faith so faith is living the life of another the next dimension of mortification is a life of sacrifice and unfortunately i do not have time to go there but uh, mortified people demonstrate transcendent sacrifices 
sacrifices that are beyond the status quo sacrifices that are beyond normal sacrifices that are scandalous that's why solomon's journey to the temple scandalous sacrifices the road to mount moriah was scattered with sacrifices that no one could number so within the city church you'll make one sacrifice and the next day you will be empowered to make another sacrifice and another and another and when you keep doing that you suddenly begin to wonder where did these resources come from you're now living from the resource of another which is the heavenly resource the commanded blessing and the commanded blessing is what we are after and it is where the brothers dwell together in unity god bless you thank you